e ngā mana e ngā reo e ngā karangatanga maha tēnā koutou. Tēnei katoa ki ki te tāpiri atu aku mihi nō te awo o Waikato, te riu o Waikato ki a koutou nō ngā hau e whā o te motu nō reira tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I have to confess, when I got here, Reira said to me, what's up, we've had two ministers in one day. I said, this is a very important conference and I want to thank you again for inviting me uh, to uh, your conference to share some thoughts on the progress that I'm making in an area that is significant in the work that you do. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, the Water New Zealand President, Kevin Hill, Chief Executive John Farlett, for organising this event and your valuable input and advice uh, throughout this year uh, on the work that I'm progressing uh, amongst uh, uh, the sector, and in particular around the Three Waters Reform. I want to take the opportunity this afternoon to, to update you on where we're at with the Three Waters Review and our thinking on where to next. I'll also briefly touch on the links between this work and the government's broader freshwater reform programme, which was spoken about earlier today. In my address to last year's conference, I outlined the scale and complexities of the challenges facing our drinking water, wastewater and stormwater systems and the clear case for change. I spoke about the serious system-wide issues identified by the Havelock North Drinking Water Inquiry and the need for decisive action in response to the inquiry's recommendations. Failure to respond to these shortcomings is not an option. The risks of water supply failure are catastrophic and we simply can't allow another Havelock North contamination to happen again. Nor should we accept a status quo where an estimated 34,000 people or more get sick from their drinking water every year. Fixing the current drinking water regulatory framework, a framework that's been described as weak, fragmented and inadequate, has been our first priority. We've responded by announcing a comprehensive system-wide overhaul of drinking water regulations. We're also undertaking targeted reforms to improve the regulation and performance of wastewater and stormwater systems. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the details, but to summarise the new regulatory framework, it will establish a new dedicated drinking water regulator, extend the regulatory coverage to all drinking water suppliers except individual household self-suppliers, provide a multi-barrier approach to drinking water treatment and safety, strengthen government oversight and stewardship of wastewater and stormwater services, and provide transitional arrangements for up to five years to allow water suppliers to adjust to the regulations. These measures will progress us towards a three water system that ensures public safety and reduces pollution from the source to the tap and back again. This step change in regulation will be led by the new drinking water regulator. Although detailed arrangements for the institutional form of the regulator are still yet to be confirmed, the organisation will have a range of responsibilities and functions necessary to oversee the new drinking water framework. Dependent on cabinet decisions, this may include sector leadership, overseeing and monitoring drinking water safety, promoting the importance of safe drinking water, ensuring coordination within the system, and ensuring that the system is meeting obligations to Māori. Compliance monitoring and enforcement, ensuring drinking water compliance in a manner that is proportionate to provider capability and safety risks to consumers. Capability building, promoting collaboration, education and training to ensure the sector has the knowledge, capability and cultural awareness to fulfil its functions. Information advice and education, being a centre of technical and scientific expertise able to provide sector-wide advice and guidance, facilitate research into drinking water science and ensure the sector is kept informed of best practice and performance report reporting, responsible for collating and publishing transparent drinking water compliance and monitoring information. Due to the strong synergies between drinking, waste and stormwater, we're also considering the feasibility of the regulator also undertaking some of the new functions for oversight of waste and stormwater within its role. However, regional councils will continue to be the lead regulator of waste and stormwater under the Resource Management Act. 
These arrangements will be the subject of further Cabinet considerations in the near future. Regardless of what the regulator's final form and roles will be, we want to have the organisation up and running quickly so we can start to see benefits from the improved regulatory system. All things going to plan, we're hoping to introduce new legislation by the end of this year to enable the regulator to go live later next year. The new regulator will need to develop extensive capabilities to undertake its role effectively. This includes the skills needed to be no, this includes the skills needed to be the public and frontline face of drinking water safety and to become a centre of technical and scientific expertise. It won't be easy. The regulator will need to work closely with the sector and utilise existing knowledge and expertise where applicable. It will need to work closely with councils and private suppliers to ensure they're aware of their regulatory responsibilities and know what to do and how to comply. It will also need to develop robust administrative systems to identify and formally register the country's many water suppliers. In addition, I expect the regulator to work with and through sector organisations and existing training and licensing bodies to help suppliers build the capabilities to achieve compliance. The knowledge and expertise of organisations like Water New Zealand will be critical in this respect. And I want to acknowledge your advocacy, Kevin, for Water New Zealand to play a significant leadership role in training and certification of schools required, especially in the transition phase. I expect there will be opportunities to partner with the new regulator in its sector leadership role, particularly in the areas of industry training and development as well as data collection and utilisation. Acquiring expertise and building ongoing relationships with Māori will also be critical to the regulator's success. This is a new and emerging area that will need to be enhanced. This approach will apply at a national level in terms of supporting and enabling te mana o te wai and upholding te tiriti o waitangi, and that would have been referred to earlier by my colleague, the Honourable, Honourable David Parker. It will also be important at a regional level, where the regulator will need to form local relationships and adapt to the unique kawa and matauranga of mana whenua in different rohi. With the introduction of a strengthened regulatory framework and bringing all suppliers into the system under the oversight of the regulator, we need to be mindful of the costs and challenges associated with achieving compliance. This was a concern heard frequently during our regional engagement earlier this year. With a transitional timeframe of up to five years to fully implement and comply with the new requirements, our regulatory approach recognises that smaller suppliers are likely to need longer to comply with their obligations. However, there remain challenges in ensuring the country's three waters system has, a long -term, has the long-term capacity and capability to deliver well-being through te mana o te wai, which is simply this, the health of the water, the health of people, and the health of the environment. This long-term challenge is best highlighted by our significant nat national water infrastructure deficit. Current estimates suggest it will cost around 500 million to upgrade our drinking water treatment plants to comply with current drinking water standards. Likewise, three to four billion may be required to upgrade our water, wastewater treatment systems over the coming years, and potentially a similar figure for stormwater. And we haven't even touched on the resilience aspects related to floodwaters and its impact in our communities. It appears that these costs are absorbable in many parts of the country, particularly in our biggest cities where costs can be shared across many people. Many councils are already planning significant water infrastructure investments in this respect. The problem we face, though, is that some of our smaller councils and communities and many non-council drinking water suppliers, such as Marae, are not well positioned to meet these costs. We will need leadership, collaboration and innovation to navigate our way towards achievable solutions and affordable solutions for these communities. We do need an approach that ensures all communities across Aotearoa benefit from safe, reliable 
healthy drinking water and three water services in an affordable way. At the end of the year, I'll be reporting back to Cabinet on ways our government can assist councils and community suppliers and operators to deliver three water services in a sustainable, cost-effective manner. I spoke last year about my trips to England, Scotland and Ireland and how their experience with water reform might inform our own unique circumstances and communities. We continue to draw insight from overseas jurisdictions to further inform analysis of reform options in the New to the New Zealand context. Back here though, my team of officials are having discussions with local government, iwi, Māori and water industry experts such as your organisation about how we might improve delivery of three water services and funding arrangements. This will include thinking differently about how these services are structured and paid for including options for sharing costs across regional communities or a nationwide fund. We also need to consider ways to build the sector's capacity and capability in terms of attracting and keeping quality professionals in the water industry. I look forward to a robust debate and analysis of these matters over the rest of the 2019 period. While central government can assist in, at a national level, Improving the way we deliver water services is a journey we must all be willing to make. It's a message that I've been giving to the local government sector. It's really encouraging to see councils in regions such as Hawke's Bay, Canterbury, Waikato and the West Coast already discussing collaborative approaches to water delivery for the areas. To help remove financial barriers and encourage further such initiatives, our government has agreed to consider on a case-by-case -case basis proposals from regions for funding to support collaborative water service delivery efforts. For eligible funding applications, we will co-invest with local gov government up to 50% of the costs associated with investing collaborative approaches to the water service delivery. This may include, for example, Financial support for a group of councils developing a business case for a dedicated regional or cross-regional water approach, delivering, delivering efficiency and quality benefits to their communities. I plan to announce further details about this funding initiative, including an applications process in the near future. The Three Waters Review is not being undertaken in isolation, as I mentioned earlier, but is proceeding in tandem with the government's wider Central Freshwater Programme led by Minister for the Environment, the Honourable David Parker. As you heard earlier from David this morning, this programme of reform is focused on ensuring an integrated and effective freshwater management system with an emphasis on improving water quality and ecosystem health. There are clear overlaps between essential freshwater and the Three Waters Review. And within the context of the consultations that are currently undertaken, the National Environmental Standard for Wastewater Discharge and Overflows is a subject that we'll be uh, seeking feedback on. Freshwater outcome source protection, better mon monitoring, enforcement and compliance of discharges and overflows, and best practice land use planning and, and stormwater design, wetland protection and restoration of urban streams uh, protection and the protection of them are all aspects that enable an interconnected benefit to improve wellbeing outcomes. Declining water quality and the loss of urban streams and wetlands is having a negative effect on aquatic ecosystems and biodiversity in our urban areas. These issues are also impeding many communities and iwi from connecting with their local waterways as many urban water bodies have become unsafe for recreation and the gathering of clay. We're looking at how we can encourage the uptake of good practice for urban water management in Aotearoa, particularly through the increased use of water sensitive urban design. I know the Urban Water Working Group is working hard to develop a suite of recommendations to promote the urban water principles and improve urban water management. These principles outline an ambitious vision for addressing degraded urban water. I've asked my officials to look hard at how these principles can inform 
the government's work, and I encourage you to participate in that conversation. This will feel like the longest conversation ever, the whole Three Waters reform <laughs> work, and I'm sure you're all thinking, less hui, more dui. But there are all sorts of political complexities in the issues that I'm presenting to you today and those associated with it. So to, in order to get through these significant and complex issues in the best condition possible, and by that I mean good water reform, considered water reform, and taking people with us, so that New Zealand can be a place where we pride ourselves on the quality of our drinking water and also our fresh water as well. We can go to our rivers and our beaches and swim and not get sick. It's a necessarily long conversation that we need everybody contributing to to get the best possible outcome. After all, if water reform is done well, and on behalf of all New Zealanders, of, of the scale and nature that I'm referring to, it's a legacy contribution to your children and my children and their children thereafter, and it's worth doing right. Mureira, kia koutou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tata katoa. Kia ora. Um, we do have some time for questions if there's a, a handheld mic if anyone's got one of those. Um, we can run that out to somebody. Thank you. Um, let's take some questions. Who, Just you? don't ask me the questions you saved for David Parker. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, look at that. Just Uh, thank you, Minister, for the talk. Uh, Steve Cooper from Mott McDonald. I just wondered um, whether you feel, as current government feels, that the RMA is the right um, statutory framework to be able to implement um, these regulatory reforms, or whether perhaps um, more of an environmental uh, uh, environmental act or, or pollution control act might be something that's more appropriate. At, for this time, uh, uh, to be absolutely frank, we do consider that the RMA is the right legislative um, framework. However, you would have potentially heard from uh, Minister Parker that he's got two phases of, him, uh, of looking at reform for the RMA. So I think the bigger issues that you're um, proposing uh, haven't yet been addressed will be in the second tranche of um, uh, reform measures for the RMA. But at this stage, yes. Down here. Kia ora, Minister Ulrich Larsen from Queenstown Lakes District Council here. I've just Kiora. come from there. <laughs> <laughs> Great place. Um, a question in, around affordability. You were talking about it must be affordable as well for the communities in regards of the regulations coming up. Have you any idea or have you thought about it how you define affordability? Well, when I think about small suppliers, let me just put it out there around Marae and how uh, the, the profile of the water supplies for Marae. Um, if I think about drinking water alone, there's probably some smart things we can do at a procurement level uh, that would actually, at, at scale, at a procurement level, that would actually help address some of the affordability issues. If I think about service delivery, and which is why I'm signalling to local government, um, I mean, and encouraging local government to pursue um, a regional solution to water service delivery, um, while there might be some high upfront costs over time, and, the, and, and if I take um, international comparators, over time that actually balances out because you've got scale and you're able to cross-subsidise. Again, that improves and that addresses some of the affordability issues as well. Just two little examples. Further questions? Down the back. Kia ora sorry to, for that little interlude. Um, sorry, Brent Condon from uh, Downer. Um, basically, it's just something more from the coal face. You mentioned urban waterways quite a bit and the, the link between Tangata Whenua, obviously, and, and waterways. Um, I find that, obviously, the stormwater conferences and the water conferences, there's a lot of theory and science and a lot of, of, of application that way. But on the coal face, a lot of it, obviously, is social intelligence and actually linking in with Tangata Whenua, with the kids and stuff like that because... 
what's happening in certain you know councils and overviews of some of our waterways in South Auckland I've got streams where we're planting lots of trees but they're not trees they're saplings saplings with a 20 to 70 percent mortality rate doesn't help those eels that are getting choked in the streams at the moment so with everything that comes with the three waters and integration you, you mentioned Tangata Fena what I found in my experience is the ways to try and bridge the gap or ways to actually reach out to local iwi and also an area you've got 60 percent Tongan Samoan Fijian so with the processes it would be nice to see some sort of platform of communication that was more than just on page you know something that was more driven in a way that makes it easier for communities to connect to their their waterways and that's something that I'm struggling with a little bit in South Auckland so just wondering what your thoughts were on that uh, my, my thoughts are that, uh, you know, kaitakitanga is, a, is an active principle of getting engaged. If we take, uh, and if, if I step back to, to lean in to, to that conversation, stepping back and looking at definitely in the Scotland and Irish model of service delivery of water, where they landed, even though they had very different um, degrees of getting to their aggregated solution, where they landed is actually how do we get communities more invested and involved in water conservation, and uh, in, in water quality, and making sure that, again, the, the whole thing around cleaning up streams, making sure marine environments are more kind of an active kaitaki role for their, those communities, that, that they're taking more um, from communities and investing it back into their business model. Kaitakitanga is exactly that. It's the active principle of getting involved, but more importantly, it draws on your local knowledge of the area and that ecosystem as to what was understood to be the rako in that area and because of the kai that was in the area. It's all relative to that. In my mind <laughs> and in my heart, I think if we can ensure that and, and, and kaitakitanga is not the preserve just of Māori. In fact, I think the approach is very much a community approach. And if we can get more New Zealanders having a relationship with their waterways and looking after them and being active kaitiaki rather than paper warriors of kaitiaki, that's going to be a total sum gain for all of us. Too few people have a relationship with the waters with which they are closest to, and that's not good. That's just not good. It's like our kids thinking that their kai only comes out of countdown and they don't know how to grow kai or where to go to get kai. We need our people getting more involved with our environment. So, there, so, so um, I guess coming back to um, the conversation you're inviting me to um, lean into is I think where it's done well, there, there are small projects that are actually owned by the whole community, but often led out by some really passionate champions who are wanting to be active kaitaki and they want to make sure that everybody understands what is, what is the special um, uh, thing about their particular stream or their hour or whatever, and I think that's a good thing. Maybe go to some of the um, climate strikes the kids are going on and just recruit some really passionate kids and go, hey, you might not be able to change the world, but come and help us change your world. But here's you know, the thing, here's, here's the thing, Radar, eh? Because young people do want to be involved in actively monitoring the health of their waterways. Yeah, of course they do. Because they, they, they hear, oh, look, our grandparents used to go here and fish, and this is the kai they got. Why aren't we getting it now? Yeah. And they just want to be asked in. Sometimes they just, they, you know, they don't have a way in. No one's ever asked them to come in. So just, yeah, find those champions. Um, well said. Further questions? Oh, we've got one here, and then I will come over to you. Oh, there we go. Tēnā koe, Minister. Ko toke oengua, ko Cameron Burton. E mahi ana ahau ki te kaunahera o ahuriri. Ko ahau te kaitiaki whakatikatikatai o. Uh, to I'm Cameron Burton, the uh, Manager of Environmental Solutions for Napier City Council. My question relates to the linkages between the Local Government Act and the Resource Management Act, particularly in relation to enforcement. Um, and as someone who leads a team of enforcement officers and, and solutionisers for our, uh, our TAIO, um, we have difficulty, particularly in Napier, and I imagine this is the same for other uh, territorial authorities as well. Um, we have people discharging stuff into our pipes and our pipe network that isn't stormwater. That comes out of those pipes and enters the environment. Uh, and we have resource consents held by the Napier City Council, which are 
regulated by the regional council, of course, as those discharge into the environment. Uh, the penalties under the LGA are a $20,000 fine upon conviction. Um, and to raise a prosecution case to get it to that area of level of, of no doubt uh, costs an awful lot of, of time, legal costs, uh, and you know, in the order of $60,000 worth of, worth of labour. Uh, whereas, on the other hand, by the City Council discharging to the environment, we can be prosecuted up to $600,000 under the RMA and put in prison for two years. So I'm just wondering whether there is any opportunity to uh, bridge a linkage between the two lots of legislation, because at the end of the day, when someone puts something into our pipe work, it is ending up in the environment regardless. So I just wonder if you've got comments on that. In short, yes. And the way we're thinking about it is lifting, lifting up the civil and criminal penalties regime to a common space and with the regulator. That's, that's where our thinking is going. Tēnā koe, Minister Shanice Takurua. I'm from Broad Spectrum in Northland. Um, nā mihi nui ki a koe for your kōrero. Um, I just wondered, um, Te Tiriti or the Treaty of Waitangi was mentioned earlier um, in your kōrero and um, the commitments that obviously government have for that. Um, but in, in conjunction to what you're saying, um, will Matauranga Māori be used um, as a basis or in conjunction uh, when reviewing this process um, and, you know, and the standards that are being looked at? Because obviously we've had uh, rahui that have been put out um, over um, various places um, in support of that and um, I just wonder if that's something that you'll be looking into from a Māori perspective. Yeah, part of the thing, uh, the approach that we've taken, uh, and essentially this was driven out by um, the Essential Freshwater Programme and our need to be, get more coherence, was to ensure that te mana o te wai is uh, set across water as an ecosystem, and insofar as the three waters work that I'm doing is to find a place for the regulator to take a more active role around how it accounts for matauranga Māori. That will have impacts on regional councils, and it won't be foreign, actually. Uh, a lot of the mātauranga um, aspiration that fall to regional councils have been as a result of treaty settlements. So they're already developing up a body of knowledge. What this work will do is gr give it greater impetus because we'll situate the expectation within the context of the regulator as well to observe mātauranga Māori as alongside other things. So in short, yes. Will it be a smooth ride? Probably not. The regulator itself will have to build up a body of knowledge and have to have some oversight mechanisms across regional councils in a more uniform way. Regional council will, will probably have to build internal capability for those that already haven't. So it's a journey, uh, but the expectation is there. And I think probably that is about all we've got time for, unless someone has a super pressing one. Okay. No, good. Uh, no? Oh, is it super pressing? Let, it's not? It is? Yes, no, yes. Yes, no? Let, oh, sure, no, no pressure. You can decide. Kura Minister uh, Jim Graham from uh, Water New Zealand. I just, um, I wonder if the regulatory reforms uh, that are um, uh, in the pipeline that are, that are underway around uh, drinking water, which um, you're very supportive of, if, if that's... Uh, if that's a finite or a finishing point, or, or do we have a situation where there's the potential for further reform with the review of the RMA that might see um, uh, in the future an approach that uh, reflects what's um, undertaken in Scandinavia where we would have a, a larger water authority that would have um, a range of functions around, around water regulation, including you know, maybe allocation, certainly wastewater, um, stormwater, those. I, I, I'm not, I'm not like asking a, you Like a whole commit. waters regulator. Yeah, and, and maybe a water minister or a water commission. I'm, I'm not asking you to commit to that, but, um, but, but what I'm asking is, is there potential for a discussion further down the road, once we've got the regulation for drinking water sorted out, to be looking at those kind of possibilities? I think it's a, a, it's a consideration that we couldn't ignore, in all honesty. We have to lift 
our aspirations up around water to quite a, uh, um, a strategic level where we're concentrating our effort on water. Um, after all, around the world, water is gold, uh, and we have uh, access to levels of fresh water that we need to preserve and protect. So at a very kind of general strategic level, I said, I believe it's a conversation we can't ignore. The other thing too is that there are areas of water, water policy that we haven't got that's sophisticated enough for the challenges of our time. Um, you know, council is always kind of saying to me, oh, it should be the four waters, and I get that. But actually, the big strategic area of policy in the water space is around oceans policy and we really need to try and tackle that. Um, you know, the most of our area is in the marine area and we have to have really good co coherent uh, policy in that space. Again, that urges us to have a big strategic conversation about where we're going with our water marine um, environment. Kia ora. Thank you very much, Minister.